Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the New Testament book of Acts. The New Testament book of Acts in chapter number 13. We of course are going through a series right now with the lineage of Jesus Christ and taking our time to walk through each and every one of these uh, people within the lineage of Christ starting from Adam and walking our way into Jesus Christ. Today we're starting in a section dealing with the idea of the kings of the kingly line and of course the first king of Israel within this lineage of Jesus Christ would be King David. And whenever we look at Old Testament figures and historical people that oftentimes the New Testament gives a summary statement or a clarification or more information. And so thus when we start our series of our our look at David, we're going to start in the book of Acts chapter number 13 and see as a message is being preached here by Paul the Apostle that we can see that in his message he mentions some information about who David is. Now of course Paul Paul is giving some information and running through the history and explaining about the judges and Samuel the prophet and then God gave uh, Saul the king. But then as we find our way in Acts 13, starting at verse number 22, he then mentions David. Acts 13 and verse number 22. And when he had removed him, so speaking about God removing Saul, he, God, raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom he, God, gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, mark a phrase that we find in the book of Acts chapter number 13. Acts number thir- chapter number 13. And notice with me in verse number 22, as we see David here, notice what God said about David in verse number 22. A man after mine own heart. A man after mine own heart. And with this, we'd like to do a character study of David. David, a man after God's own heart. David, a man after God's own heart. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come and explore the historical figure of David, that we could examine his life and then we could see what is it that made David a man after your own heart? What was it, the qualities, the things that you looked at that gave him the mind of Christ, the heart of God, and that we could look in and apply to ourselves and see these things that we could also develop that same heart and that same mind which the Lord Jesus Christ had. Fill me with your spirit now as we open this up and that we can learn more about David, that you would direct us. Let us learn more of you through your Bible and through this historical figure of David. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, of course, King David has a plethora, many things that are said about him in Scripture. And to be able to take one message and try to cram in the entire life of David into one message is just impossible. In fact, the last time that we tried it, we had 66 messages on the life of David. And so you could always refer to the series to find the details. But in this case, what we're trying to do is we're trying to nail down and do a summary. And with this, if God had stated that David was a man after God's own heart, then let's explore this subject. What is it, what qualities, what things about David's life gave him that allowed God to say that he was a man after mine own heart? And that we could mimic, that we could learn these qualities for our own life. If you don't mind, I believe there are three things in the life of David that would characterize why God would say that David was a man 
after his own heart. The very first thing I'd like to show you in the life of David is that he was a man of faith. A man of faith. If you don't mind, let's examine this in one specific part uh, of David's life in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. That David was a man of faith. 1 Samuel chapter number 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now of course the Bible talks about the book of Hebrews that without faith it is impossible to please God. It's impossible to please God. And so of course if David was going to be a man after God's own heart and to be pleasing to him, David had to be a man of faith. By the way, let's define faith while you're looking at 1 Samuel chapter number 17. How do we define faith? Well, faith is defined in Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse 2 as this, looking unto Jesus. That's a good definition of biblical faith. Looking unto Jesus. And so David was a man who had faith. He was looking unto God and trusting in God's promises. Trusting that God was God. He had faith. And we could see this demonstrated in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now we had covered this previously when we had talked about Jesse, David's father. How David had been sent out into the uh, battlefield of the valley of Elah. And he was to check on his brother and deliver some And he heard the Philistine, Goliath, come and give a challenge. And David looked around and said, is there not a cause? Is there, what is being done about this? And as we pick this up in mid-story, as David has heard the giant uh, Goliath give a challenge, notice what David says himself in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17, and notice with me in verse number 29. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 29. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? He's looking at these people with a lack of faith. What had happened is that the armies of Israel and the Philistines had met together in the valley of Elah. On one side you had the Philistines. On the other side you had the children of Israel. On one side you had people who believed in a false god. And over here you had the children of Israel that supposedly trusted in the living God of Israel. Now, the representative of the Philistines was the giant Goliath. And he presented a challenge. He stepped out, he being nine foot tall and four inches. His armor weighed 125 pounds. His spearhead, just the the head of the spear, weighed 16 pounds, while the shaft was 17 pounds. Pounds, making the entire thing all together 33 pounds. I don't want you to math this morning. I'll do it for you. Now all of Israel was afraid of his challenge. And this continued for 40 days that the Goliath would, co- uh, Goliath would come out of Philistine. He would come out and say, listen, let's not have all of our armies fight each other. I will be the champion of our army. You send out one guy. Just one person. We'll fight it out. If you lose, we now conquer you. If he somehow beats me, and you can almost hear a chuckle, then we will surrender to you. And he says, come on, let's just settle this. Let's not have all this needless bloodshed. One champion versus one champion. And for 40 days, he did this. And not only did he give the challenge, but he would curse God. I thought your God was real. Hey, wasn't your God the one who opened the Red Sea? Isn't this God who defeated the armies of Pharaoh? Hey, isn't your God the one who brought down the walls of Jericho? (laughs) Ha ha ha. Your God is nothing because none of you are willing to stand. When David hears this, He's upset. He looks at them and says, is there not a cause? How come none of you have gone out there? Listen, it's not between you and him now. It's between him and God. God's going to fight this battle because he challenged God. Can't you watch God do something? And he starts yelling at people and starts saying, hey, how come no one's answered this challenge? Well, of course, when you have a little 
pipsqueak 17 year old starting to make a big fuss. How come no one's going out there? It started to make through the grapevine news. There was nothing else for them to do to hear except this gossip. So notice in verse number 30. And he, David, turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. Meaning like, what is going to be done about this? Verse 31. And when the words were heard which David spoke, they rehearsed them before Saul and sent for him. And David said to Saul, now remember Saul's the king right now, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with the Philistine. So finally when they bring him before Saul and Saul says, I, we hear that you saying that why isn't someone doing something about it? He says, listen, I'll go. So you can imagine Saul. Now remember, Saul is head and shoulders above everyone else. He's tall. And he looks down at this little runt, pipsqueak, 17-year-old, who says, I'll go fight him. Looking at this young man who's not even in the army, not even old enough, he's going to go fight this Goliath. Notice, if you don't mind, in verse 33. And Saul said unto David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine and fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. Listen, I know that you're eager, and I know you're pipsqueak, but let me tell you, Goliath's been killing people since he was a kid. You're just a kid yourself. What are you, how are you going to fight this guy? Notice what David respond to him in verse 34. And David said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him, that lamb, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. And thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. Now David says, listen... I've trusted in God before and I watched him work. Now, in the ancient world, especially in this uh, land, lions were severe killers, very much killers. Bears were also something you didn't want to mess with. And he says, as I'm tending my flock one day, I come and watch a lion sneak in, grab one of the lambs and take off. You want to know what I did? I ran after him. And when I came up to her, I confronted the lion. And the lion wanted to raise up against me because he didn't want to let go of the lamb. So I grabbed the lion by the beard and I killed him. And later on, a bear tried to do the same thing. And let me tell you, I didn't let the bear get to it because God had given me a job to do. And I trusted that God was able to deliver me. He says, listen, that pipsqueak out there is nothing to a lion and a bear. And God helped me fight them. He'll also help me fight him. Notice he continues with that idea in verse number 36. And the servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. Seeing that he defied the armies of the living God. David said, listen, it's not my fight. It's God's fight. He got God involved. God could do all the thing. He's just going to use me. He doesn't have to use me. He can use any one of you if you're willing to stand up. God will fight his own battles. Someone just needs to go out there and exercise some faith. Verse number 37. And David said, moreover, the Lord that delivereth me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. After all, no one else is volunteering. After 40 days, the only person to volunteer is a little pipsqueak guy who says, listen, God's going to fight my battles for me. He's going to go take care of this uncircumcised Philistine. Okay, have at it. Let's go. So notice as he goes on. Verse 38, and Saul armed David with his armor and he put on a helmet of brass on his head and he armored him with a coat of mail and David girded his sword upon his armor, and he assuaged to go, for he not, had not proved it. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put him off. So what happened is that Saul said, all right, if you're going to go fight this giant, then you might as well look like a soldier. So they put on some plate mail. By the way, plate mail is heavy. If you've never had it in your hand, it can weigh up to 35 pounds. So, can you imagine this young youth who's never been practiced with armor 
wearing this armor, weighting him down. And then he has his helmet. And this helmet's uncomfortable. You have to be trained to get used to it and to ignore it. So he has the helmet on his head. And he gets the sword. And swords are heavy too. And so he's going out here and he says, listen, I haven't proved them. The word proving means I haven't put them to the test. I haven't trained in this. I'm not used to going. If I go out here like this, I'm going to be handicapped because I'm not used to wearing this. I'm not used to going out with this. I can't go out with this. Then what are you going to go out with? No armor. Oh, that sounds better. No sword. What are you going to use? I'm going to use a slingshot. You can go to fight this nine foot four giant who's fought all of his life with no armor and a little slingshot. No sword. Are you out of your mind? David said, listen, the joy of the Lord's my strength. I'm trusting in God. He's going to fight my battles for me. I'm going to put him to the test. He's a man of faith. Notice as it goes on, verse number 40. And he took off his staff in his hands and chose, or he took his staff in his hands and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, he, uh, which he had even on a script and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. Now let's pause here. Some people get super spiritual and try to say, you know, the reason why David took five stones is because Goliath had four brothers and whatnot. I don't believe that's true. I don't think he was looking for the future battles. I think he was looking for the battle at hand. And if you're going to go fight someone, at least you have enough ammunition. All right. There was nothing here. That was just common sense. There was no super spiritual. Well, I'm going to go kill. I don't think he took time to find uh, Goliath's lineage and says, listen, sir, before we fight, I want to make sure I get all of your family killed. So can I go ahead? I don't think that was any of that. I think he said, I'm going to go fight. I want to make sure I am armed up with the ammunition I'm used to using. No use of carrying one if the one doesn't do the job. So and more of a practical notice, if you don't mind. And uh, verse number 40, and he took off his, or took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, which uh, put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a script. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near to David and the man that bare his shield went before him. Now, back in the ancient world, because shields are so heavy, they had what was called a shield bearer. And his job was to hold the shield in front of the armor. So here it's almost two against one. The guy is supposed to hold the shield while Goliath does the fighting. So he comes out, Goliath's behind him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him for he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves with his staff? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. So Philistine comes out and he's insulted. He was waiting for a warrior to show up. But now they send out this little punk teenager who doesn't have a sword but has a little stick and a, and a couple and a slingshot. This is who's going to defeat me. He looks and says, what am I, just a dog? Is that all I am? You think this little pipsqueak could beat me? And he starts cursing David to his gods and starts using foul language. Verse number 44. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give thy flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beast of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, thou comest with me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou defied. Now here's David's faith. He goes out and says, listen, I'm armed with God. God's going to fight the battle. I'm just here to watch. God's going to fight the battles. You're the one who insulted God. You have to deal with him. Now, notice again, he's a teenager. He's not used to insulting people. By the way, that's how you know you've raised a good kid when they don't know how to insult people. Notice verse, verse 47, 46. And this day the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee, and take thee, thy head from off thee, and give the carcasses of the host of the Philistine unto the day to the fowls of the air, and to the wild beast of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. He goes and gives the same insult that Goliath said to him. He said, all right, fine. No, I'm going to give you to the fowls of the air and to the beast. By the way, and God's going to win this battle that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. You see, this battle is not between you and me. The battle is between you and him. And I'm just going to be here to watch as he kills you. 
Notice in this, verse 7, 47. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hands. Now, he's almost saying this for the crowd behind him. Listen, they need to know that the battle's the Lord. This was a matter of faith. This battle was not against man and man. This is a battle that God was going to fight. And they need to know back there that this battle's of the Lord. They need to know that God could fight his own battles. By the way, it's a reminder that we need to be to know that the battle's the Lord's. And that God can fight his own battles. And we just get to be there to watch. Verse 48. And it came to pass. That when the Philistine arose. He came and drew nigh to meet David. And David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Now most people in their right mind. When they see a giant charging towards them. You'd probably run the different direction. David ran towards them. He says oh you want to run? Let's go. And he started running right towards him. And David put his hand in his bag and took hence a stone and slung it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon David to the earth. What was Goliath thinking about right here? He was deeply impressed, I believe. As that stone went deep into his forehead. Verse number 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took a sword and drew it out the sheath thereof and slew him and cut his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now, most people, when they watch a fight between two people, whether it's boxing or whatever else, they want the match to be entertaining. Can you imagine as they watch their champion who can't be defeated, all of a sudden run towards this little pipsqueak. Little pipsqueak throws a stone, puts it in his head, the champion falls, and then this little pipsqueak stands on him. And it happened just so quickly. It was done and over with. There was a shock there. So David looked around, wanted to prove that the champion was dead, went and drew Goliath's own sword. By the way, this was a massive beast, about 50 pounds. That's a heavy sword. Can you imagine you trying to lift something that way? Now, a sword is a little bit awkward in weight, so it's not like carrying a 50-pound bag where you can use both hands. This is awkward in weight. He comes and he takes and he cuts off the head of the giant and he holds it up. By the way, later on, he kept the head for a long time. Just as a reminder. But can you imagine the jaws dropping to the Philistine army when this little pipsqueak 17-year-old punk with no armor comes on and is holding the head of their champion? What did they do? They took off and ran. I mean, they weren't afraid of David. They were afraid of David's God. And they didn't want to end up the same way and they took off. Now, finally, the... uh, scaredy cat army of Israel realized, hey, you know what? God is on our side. Just like we heard in the past. And they went chasing after the Philistines. About time. Notice what happened, if you don't mind, in uh, verse number 52. And when the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines unto the gates of Ekron, which is one of the cities of the Philistines. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way of Shechem, even in a gath unto Ekron. And so here was this mighty army and this defeated by one little pipsqueak of a kid or rather the pipsqueak of a kid's God who was the God of Israel. What made David a man after God's own heart? First of all, he was a man of faith. What is faith? It's looking unto Jesus. It's putting our trust into God. That without faith it is impossible to please him. What made David so special? He believed that God was. That God was God. And that God can be God. That was part of what made David a man after God's own heart. Is that he was able to trust God even in impossible situations. What's another reason that made David a man after God's own heart? Well, first of all, he was a man of faith. Second of all, he was a man of the word. A man of the word. Notice with me, if you don't mind, 2 Samuel chapter number 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel is towards the end 
of David's life. And notice what God gives um, to David in the midst of this. As David has been king for a while. And 2 Samuel chapter number 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23. And notice what God gives a commentary dealing with the idea of, of David. Now these be the last words of David. David the son of Jesse said... The man who was raised up on high and anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweetest psalmist of Israel said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me and his word was in my tongue. Here we could see that David was used of God to actually pin scripture. And David was someone who loved God's word and wanted to be used of God with God's word. He was a man of the word. Notice the phrase in verse 1 where God referred to him as the sweetest psalmist of Israel. We believe that David is responsible for pinning at least 70 of the Psalms found in what we call the book of Psalms. Now many of these Psalms are, ca are called Messianic Psalms because they are predictive uh, Psalms. Psalms of prophecy that deal with the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Here's an example. We have a trinity of Psalms in Psalm 22, Psalm 23, and Psalm 24. Notice if you don't mind, let's look at these trinity of Psalms. Psalm 22 first. Now God used David to pin the scripture. And David said, listen, God's spirit moved and my tongue was moved by the spirit of God. These were God's words, not my words. I was just used as a penman, as an instrument to give these words. What are some examples? Well, in Psalm 22, Psalm 23, and Psalm 24, speak about the Lord Jesus Christ before Jesus Christ walked on the earth. If you want to put approximate date of David's life, it's about 1000 BC. We would put the life of Christ near 0 to 30 uh, AD. So 1,000 years before Jesus Christ was robed in flesh, David spoke these. And each one of these Psalms speak about something different about Jesus Christ. Psalm 22 speaks about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. What Jesus was going through while he was on the cross. Psalm 23 speaks about Jesus being the great shepherd. So Psalm 22 talks about the suffering Savior. Psalm 23 talks about the good shepherd. And then in Psalm 24, it speaks about him being the king of glory. Let's examine Psalm 22. And again, thousand years before Jesus Christ died on the cross, this is what God used David to pin, which spoke about what Jesus was going through from Jesus' perspective while he was on the cross. Notice with me Psalm 22 verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why hast thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. In the night season am not silent. But thou art holy. O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They were trusted thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm. And no man. A reproach of men. And despised of the people. All they that see me. Laugh me to scorn. They shoot up the lip. They shake their head saying. He trusted on the Lord. That he would deliver him. Let him deliver him. Seeing he delighteth in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope. When I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me. Trouble is near. For there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. Notice verse 14. I am poured out like water. 
and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. Here it is speaking about Jesus on the cross. And if you remember when the Roman soldiers put the spear into his side. That the Bible says that water and blood had poured out. And again that's consistent with the historical account of Jesus Christ. Verse number 15. My strength is dried up like part shard. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. That was brought me to the dust of death. Again, Jesus Christ, because he had left, lost so much blood, was actually suffering through hypovolemic shock. Hypo means um, low, volemic means volume, uh, meaning the volume of blood. He's actually dying of hypovolemic, uh, low blood volume. He's tremendously thirsty. Remember, he's on the cross. One of the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross, I thirst. He was going and losing so much of, of uh, blood at this time, he was thirsty. Verse 16, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell on my bones, they look up and stare at me. Verse 16, of course, he was pierced in his hands and feet. Verse 17, uh, his bones are actually knocked out of socket because of the cross. Verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. The Roman soldiers had gambled for Jesus' clothes. Be not thou far from me, O Lord, my, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the, my, from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto thy brethren in the midst of the congregation I will praise thee and then the end of it begins to praise God that God can be trusted through this all so Psalm 22 speaks about what is Jesus going through from his perspective on the cross Psalm 23 speaks about Jesus being the good shepherd and of course this is a passage most people can quote notice with me Psalm 23 verse 1 the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We're thankful that Jesus Christ, he is the good shepherd. And then in Psalm 24, still speaking of Jesus Christ, 1,000 years before Jesus Christ was incarnate, it speaks of Jesus Christ as the king, the coming king. Psalm 24 verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell there. Therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand at his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him and seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your hands, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. And again, these are just three of the 70 psalms that David was used to pen. And again, many of them were messianic songs that saw, talked about the coming Jesus Christ. Now again, we're addressing what made David a man after God's own heart. Well, first of all, he was a man of faith. He looked unto God and trusted God's promises. Second of all, he was a man of the word. He was used of God to give us the word and he in turn loved the word of God. He was a man of the word. But there's one more thing about David. What made David a man after God's own heart? He was a man of repentance. A man 
of repentance. With that, turn with me to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Now, if we were just to stop here and not dive into the story of David, we'd almost say, well, David's perfect. He was a man of faith from his youth. He was someone used of the word of God. I, of course, I can't relate to him. Well, actually, some people believe that the idea of being a man after God's own heart means that you have the absence of sin. That's not true at all. David was a horrible sinner. David was a murderer. David was an adulterer. He did other sins. Well, you say, how can someone be a man after God's own heart if he was a sinner? Well, the thing is that made David a man after God's own heart is that he was a good repenter. He was a good repenter. One of these Psalms, Psalm 51, speaks about David's repenting to God after his sin with Bathsheba and his murder of Uriah the Hittite. And that he was able to get right with God again. Now, it's not the idea that I sin and therefore I just say, God, I'm sorry. But it's actually a heartfelt repentance. God, what I did was wrong and I shouldn't have done it. Notice what David says about this. Psalm 51 and verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to thy multitude of tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest and clear when thou judgest? Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide my face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God. Thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure, a desire, and build the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of the righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Psalm 51, we can see David's heart as he's getting right with God. I'm so thankful that the book the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 that God says that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What made David a man after God's own heart? He was a man of repentance and he developed the habit that he didn't allow sin to stay in his life. That as soon as it was confronted with it, as soon as it was pointed out, he would get it right with God. What keeps people from being the man, uh, man after God's own heart? Well, part of the reason is that we don't keep short accounts with God. We allow our sin just to linger on us for such a long time. That we don't get right with God. We don't confess our sin. We don't try to be right with God. We're not broken of our sin. We're not sorry for our sin. And therefore, we never get right. We just let it stack up and build upon us. What made David a man after God's own heart? It wasn't the absence of sin. It was that he was willing to get right every time God confronted to him. And so with these three things, we can see what made God, or David, a man after God's own heart. First of all, he was a man of faith. He was a man of the word. And he was a man of repentance. By the way, 
Did you know that you can have the same heart of God? You can have the mind of Christ that the book of Philippians tells us. How can you have that? Well, first of all, if you're a person of faith, if you're willing to trust God and to trust that God can do anything, that God is God and that there is none else, that you allow him to fight the battles for you, you allow him to be God. Second of all, to be a man of the book. If you've never written this statement down, write it down now. You cannot be a spiritual person without first being a scriptural person. There is no such thing as someone who's not right with or someone who is right with God who is not in the Bible. There is no such animal. You cannot be right with God if you are not in the Bible for yourself. That is a true statement of fact. Also, let me kick it while I'm here. This idea of reading a chapter a day keeps the devil away is false. You need to be portions of scripture. You need to be reading it for yourself. You will not have the mind of God or the heart of God without being in the book. Then third of all, David was a great repenter. And because of 1 John 1, 9, because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, you can get right with God whenever you want. You're always as close to God as you want to be. What is the secret? Keeping short accounts with God. God understands that we're nothing but dust and that we're failures. That's not an excuse to sin. It's an acknowledgement that we do sin. But once we do sin, we need to be able to confess it to God and get right with God for right away. Not to allow it to stack up, not to allow it to build up. But as soon as we're confronted, keep short accounts with God. And you can be cleansed and washed. Be whiter as snow, what David had said in Psalm 51. What a wonderful thing it is to be thoroughly right with God. So let me ask you the question, dear friend. Can you consider yourself a man, a lady, a person after God's own heart? Well, first of all, are you a person of faith? Are you someone who trusts God and looks at God and understands that God can solve the problems? Second of all, are you a man, a woman, a person of the book? Could it be said of you that you spend quality time in the Bible every day? You cannot be a spiritual person without first being a scriptural person. If you're not in the Bible, you do not have the mind of Christ and you do not have the heart of God. Are you a person of the book? Third of all, are you a good repenter? Meaning that if someone was to confront you with sin, if God was to confront you with sin, the Bible was to confront you with sin, preaching was to confront you with sin, are you quick to get it right? Or do you just put it off? Say you'll deal with it later. Are you sensitive that as soon as you tell a lie that God smites you and says you need to fix that and you get it right right then? We need to get to the place where we're good repenters. That we're willing to get things right with God as quickly as God confronts it with us. Could it be said of you that you're a person after God's own heart? Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.